and you get electron flow off of that. So in an electron microscope, you have something up in the top <coughs> called a, uh, there we go. Let's just get this really quick. Uh, yeah, this. Hey, we can save the notes now, huh? Okay, so if we start at the very top, um, basically, there's going to be a cable coming out of this. Okay, so basically, we're going to call the very top of the microscope, it's going to be called the gun section, and inside the gun section is a filament. And we refer to that uh, if I open up this, I'm just going to pop back and forth really quick here. So if we open up the top of this microscope, you can see up here, this would be the gun section. Okay, so that's a gun section. If we're at a vent, we can pop the gun open and we can take a look at the filaments that are located inside. But that's how it kind of sort of starts. So, and in that gun section, you apply a voltage. And that voltage is, is variable. And, and right now it goes anywhere from minus 30 kV all the way down to 100 volts, negative. So it's always negative voltage. Okay, so we apply voltage to that. Okay, so that's the filament itself. And then right below the filament, we have something here. And I'm sorry I can't, you know, but anyway. And that's going to be an anode. And that's just realistically... I like the bracing portion. <laughs> uh, whoops. Almost went down. Went <laughs> down almost. Jimmy's down. Jimmy's down. <laughs> okay, there's going to be a hole in the center of that. I'm just trying to make that a little bit... So, this is also going to be referred to as, okay, great. So, we're going to have a cathode to anode relationship, you have neg negative 30,000 volts at the top, that gets generated down, so it has electron flow, and then right below that, what we have here is called a column liner. Column liner. So the electrons are going to flow down this column liner, and then on the outside of this, we have a couple of things. I'm going to call these. These are coils, and the first set of coils are going to be called. Beam alignment or gun alignment coils. So you generate a beam, it's got a cathode to anode relation, the beam starts flowing down the column, and then you have a beam alignment section, and basically what that does is it grabs the electrons, and it says, yeah, we're going to move them over this way, or move them over this way, or x and y direction, and it's for alignment. And what we're looking for is maximum signal. So there's going to be features on the display CRT, the display screen of our operating system, and it's going to be called GAY and GAX, so gun alignment X and gun alignment Y. And so those are functions that you may be using. And so, if it's a function on the display screen, we should talk about it. Okay, yep? So, for the purpose of this illustration, when we see one pair, then there's, reality, there's two pairs. In reality, there's two bottoms. There's one, there's, there's little tiny coils uh, in X direction, X, and then two coils in Y direction. That's right. Okay. Yep, so, uh, beam alignment section. The, the next set of coils that we see coming down here, That's known as the condensial lens, and people refer to that as probe current. And so basically what that does is, as the beam is generated, it's going down the column, with the, with, when you apply voltage to this set of coils, and basically it takes the electrons and it spreads them, it opens them, or it makes them smaller. So the smaller diameter of the beam, the better resolution you'll have, unless you want to get some higher magnification shots, 100,000, 150, 200,000 X, you want the beam diameter to be very, very small. So it can go inside looking all little nooks and crannies. Let's say if you do an x-ray analysis, right? If you want to get a lot of x-ray counts, or if you're doing EDS, for instance, like you guys want to go to Dan with that one sample. So if you want to see percentages of elements located in different various areas, you may need more beam to get the amount of x-ray information from that sample. 
So that's another feature of the microscope that's fully adjustable. And again, it's up to you as the operator to say, hey, I need this type of probe current or I need this type of probe current. Just to let you know, that little cube has probably one of the most amazing condenser lenses that I've ever seen in the industry. Um, I'm running that cube all the time, the smallest spot size, the, the smallest probe current we can run, and it still gives me a ton of signal, which to me is just unbelievable. And I have, I have numbers, I'd say, it runs from spot size 1 to spot size 20. So you have 20 variable settings that you can adjust, but I'm running the thing so small all the time, it's still have a ton of signal, which is, which is really, really impressive. And I don't know what the exact numbers are going to be until we get an EDS detector, and I'll know exactly how, much, how many x-ray events I'm getting from that. But just from my small, from my you know, limited time that I've been in this industry since 1987, um, to me it's really, really impressive. So that says a little bit there. So condensed probe current, that's a feature that, that we'll have on it. This, this, we're going to be talking about all of these things as I'm running the SCM. So this is just a correlation. Okay. So condensed lens, and then after, after there we have something else in here, and it's kind of like a little sleeve in here. And inside that sleeve, we have another set of coils and another set of coils, two sets of coils. And then this comes down just like this. And this whole section here um, is going to be called So we have two things, two sets of coils down at the very bottom. This, this, this whole section is called the final lens, and in here we're going to actually take another piece out of that. Okay. Yeah, whole piece is kind of right, but anyway. So this whole section now is called the final lens, and we have several bobbins inside the final lens. The first thing is, uh, we have something that's called the stigmator bobbins, and stigmation is, as the beam is coming generating down this column, the beam could be coming down uh, not perfectly circular. It could be coming down as a stretch, or as a stretch this way. And what the stigmator bobbins are responsible for is they input a field and make the beam perfectly circular. So when you focus, when you focus this beam, picture like, picture like a cone as it's turning and getting down to a point and turning back up again. But it wants to stay like a circle, circular vortex going down to focus and coming back up. It can't be wide or stretched in any direction. That, it, that puts a field into the image and it makes the image look not focused. So that's what it'll look like. It, and then when you try to focus it, it looks like it stretches in one direction and stretches in another direction. So these stigmator bobbins are extremely important when you're running the tool. So not only do you focus the microscope, but you're stigmating it as well. Those will be those would be controls that, to you as an SEM operator, become like, it's almost like breathing, it's second nature. You're going to focus, statement, done. You're always focusing, statement, focus, statement, focus, statement, focus, statement. That's, that's the basis of running an SEM. You always have to make sure that the image is statement. Meaning, And that's what it actually doing. It's actually taking the beam, it's making it perfectly circular. Statement box. And then, directly below that, we have something else that are called... Scan coils, hence scanning electron microscope. All right, so what these coils do is they take the beam, they shook it over to one side, and then they raster it very, very quickly across the sample surface, retrace, raster very quickly across the sample surface, retrace, and they continuously do that. And it's happening so quickly that it seems like it's a live image, but it's not. It's one point at a time, but it's going so quickly, it's rastering so fast, and we're digitally, we're digitally encoding it, and it actually looks like you're looking at a TV image, but realistically, it's one point at a time, hence scanning electron microscope. All right, so scan goals. There's really no input there required of you folks, to let you know it's just what it's doing. Um, 
They're slow, they're scan speed, you can slow the scan speed down. When I, when I go to photo mode, that's what it does, and it clears that old image, it looks really, really nice. That's what slow scan is, so it's just taking the scan calls, slowing them down a little bit, spending a little bit more time uh, at each point, and it's just filtering out any type of noise. And so we're gonna go over that as well. Okay, so you have scan coils, stigmator bobbins. The last piece is the final lens, and the pole piece is where the beam actually comes out of, and the final lens is responsible for telling the beam exactly how, how much distance it needs to go before it comes to a point. And the point is actually a crossover. It's not like... It's a crossover. So for instance, if this distance from the pole piece to the lens is 10 millimeters, great. You could tell it to focus at Twenty millimeters, or at thirty millimeters, or at forty millimeters. So the final is responsible for it's making that beam cross over to get to that point to where the focal field is. And so you say, why? Why do we care about working distance? Well, there's 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 stuff that are involved with working distance. One of the things that's involved with working distance that eventually will be installed on this microscope is peripheral things like an X-ray detector, right? And if we kind of like just erase this thing, made our bobbins and pole pieces, move this out of the way for right now. And coming off the side here will be your x-ray detector, right? Well, and if we kind of erase this a little bit, let's say our sample. That's our sample down there, right? So if the beam, the beam hits here, it needs some type of takeoff angle to hit the detector. If the detector was down here, right? Well, then the sample needs to be down here. Make sense? So there needs to be some type of working distance relationship with your x-ray detector. And that's going to be around 12 millimeters working distance. So that's going to be something that, you know, when you get to the detector, we're going to set that parameter up for you guys. And we'll say, okay, um, you know, you need to be 12 millimeters working distance or else you're not going to get... So that will be the maximum uh, sample size and height. Sample distance will be 12 millimeters distance. Okay. You know, for x-ray analysis. For x-ray analysis. And when we say sample distance, we're talking about top surface of the sample to where the beam hits, right? Because you could put like, you know, let's say you put like, you know, I don't know, like, you know, the sample that kind of sort of look like that, right? And then your cradle, your stub is down here. So the sample is realistically, what, 15 millimeters above the stub itself. Well, we only care about the top surface, right? So that still needs to be 12, 12, 12, and that's when you're going to be able to move your stage around and say, okay, I'm always going to be at that 12 millimeters to do my EDS, my x-ray analysis. Let's just move him out of the way for right now. So, if our sample is below here, right? There's our sample. And if the distance was 10 millimeters or, or a beam is crossing over, right? So, as the electrons hit this, you have some electrons that are doing this business, right? You have some electrons that are doing this, Right? And so the electrons that are doing this, this is called secondary. And so the secondary electrons give you a really nice, a real nice bright view of the image. It looks really, really nice, and that's the standard SEM is always secondary. It looks fantastic. So you also have electrons that shoot straight up. I mean, these guys are known as primary. Or And so you have a four quadrant backscatter detector on that microscope, which is actually mounted. Your backscatter detector is mounted to the base of the pole piece, and it steals like three millimeters of working distance. And so if we're talking about backscatter, so your backscatter detector kind of looks like this if we're looking at it upside down. It's almost like a stop sign. It has a hole in the center, right? That's what the beam comes through. So picture this, like 
bolted to the bottom, right? That's what's going on right now. And it's got quadrants. So it's channel A, channel B. Or one, two, three, four. And that's how it's labeled in this microscope. One, two, three, four. So you can turn different quadrants on and off to get what type of topographical viewing you want. So you can have channel one and two on and three and four off. And that'll give you shading on that side. So you'll see different shading the way the image is looking. Or you can turn off three, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four, get that shading. Or you can have them all on at the same time. Why would you do that? Just, just, just for instance, if the sample had a lot of like, uh, let's say, structure, and let's say it had like a grid, for instance. And then on one side of the grid, really you can't see that face of it if you're looking at everything. So if you turn off two, then you'll see that side of the grid light up a little bit better uh, than well, the other side of the grid. It's like this where you can actually, there's four quadrants of lighting and you yep. can shut them all individually. And each one is going to give you like a different shape pattern. Absolutely. Yep, same thing. Okay. So backscatter is a, is a nice option, but again, um, it steals about three millimeters of working distance, so you know you can't go up to one millimeter, for instance. But your normal operating condition on a microscope is going to be somewhere around 10 millimeters. That's where it almost going to be. So again, we just draw the sample back in here again, and then the beam hits it, and some of the electrons do this, and those are the secondaries. These are the primaries. And also, other events are happening off of it as well, and those are obviously X-ray events. X-ray events. And that's what the X-ray detector coming off the side will be picking up. So also in here, um, how these electrons get to anything, because right now they're just right, so you have an extra detector that's picking that up. You also have a secondary detector that's coming off the side here. It's a finger, realistically. And so this guy is sitting at he's sitting at plus 10 kV. So you've got negative 30, 20, 10, whatever you have there, right? So you have a very strong path of conductivity, right? Electrons are shooting down the column, hitting the sample, and they're immediately flying over the secondary detector. They're immediately flying over there. And that's going to give you your best view and your best topography. Column. So, questions about the column. So, every feature, everything we're talking about here is going to relate to something that's going on inside that cube. A control that we're going to be using. Whether we're turning the filament on, whether we're saturating the filament, whether we're changing our probe current, spot size, sample height, so on and so forth. So far, so good? All right, so if we can, we'll get another page on this. Oh, just swipe. Just uh, swipe. Yes? Yes, it should work. Oh, cool. Oh, it work. Great. So if we were to draw, like, you know, just a very rough interpretation of this column, right? right? So it's kind of like. You know, it's a very straight piece, right? Oops. <laughs> Except for my arm, right? Right. So this would be your stage door that opens, right? This would be your gun section up here. Right? Chamber. Stage. Also inside here. Son of a gun. There we go. Okay, so what also is on this column is a final aperture assembly. It holds four different final apertures, and that gets that gets inserted through the center of the column. And so as the beam comes down, there's four different diameter apertures that the beam can go through for the same reasons as, hey, I want a smaller beam because we did the denser lens, right? Can't get the beam small enough to get the resolution I want, or I may want a larger beam to do my X-ray count. So we have four selectable final apertures, and they are uh, so you have two. So you have two twenty micron, one fifty micron, and one one hundred micron aperture, and I leave it on the smallest one, twenty. So, an electron microscope, right? Electrons won't flow in the air, right? Just like a light bulb. 
right? So if you put a hole in your light bulb, right, the filament burns out in like a millisecond, right? It just burns out to nothing. So in order to get rid of the air in the microscope, we have a pumping system, right? And so behind this chamber, right, if we were to get rid of this, behind this chamber we have a port with a valve connects to another port. We have a turbo pump that's inside that housing. Uh, it's a very small turbo pump, and it runs about 60,000 RPM or so. So it, uh, it works really, really well. And uh, there's another valve over here, and that leads down to, um, if we were to draw a hose, that's your hose. So, you have a mechanical pump laying on the floor, right? You've got a hose running up to a vibration pod, which is currently on top of your counter. And then that hose, in turn, runs up to the valve in here, the, the chamber valve, which then exposes the turbo. The turbo can't start by itself. It requires vacuum to get going. And that's what the mechanical pump is for. So you have two levels of vacuum. One is the mechanical pump turns on, and that pulls you down to like 10 to the minus 3 tor, which is just a, a, a figure of vacuum. And then, after that, that turns around, the turbo starts spinning, and the turbo pulls you down to 10 to the minus 5. And so, as soon as the vacuum conditions are met, then the microscope allows you to turn it on through various safety interlocks. And then you turn it on, basically it's just a, a run feature, and then we start operating. 